say 2020, and uh, unfortunately, we cannot see each other because of Corona that attacked the world. But there is a positive outcome to Corona because each one of us uh, used his uh, tremendous creative resources to substitute Ikasi for something that will be meaningful for all of us. So today, <coughs> I would like to invite you to a supervision group that I conduct with few of the graduate students, psychotherapists, professionals, all of them my assistants, that uh, we gathered here and we have a supervision session once a week and we decided to uh, invite you to our supervision group today. And I would like to introduce our participants, Adi. Hi, I am Adi Hevroni. I worked many years as human resources manager. Then I decided I want to graduate the individual psychology uh, studies in Adler Institute. I work as a TA for Rachel and others since I graduate. I have a private clinic. We meet here once a week to to have a group supervision. Thank you, Adi, and I really enjoy your, well, and I welcome you here with us. And I would like uh, now, Shirley, to introduce yourself. Hi, my name is uh, Shirley Legum. Uh, I come from the art therapy uh, world, group therapy, especially theater, playback theater. For years, I was searching for a psychology uh, and, um, path for my uh, um, assisting people. And after researching a lot, I found that the Adlerian individual psychology was so suitable for all the artistic and creative things that I do. And I found a, a very valuable way to connect between all those things. Uh, luckily, I uh, was a student of uh, Rachel Schifron, and now uh, I am TA with my friends here. And um, we are uh, privileged to meet here once a week to do deep work uh, of supervision and specializing, of course, in early memories to help other people. Thank you, Shirley. And it really is a delight to see how uh, diversified your backgrounds are. And we all are gathering here. So I would like now Shira to introduce yourself. Thank you, Rachel. Um, my name is Shira, Shira Harpaz. I originally come from the field of physiotherapy, uh, specialized in the area of uh, child development. Uh, I've been a physio for many, many years, and then I decided to widen uh, and complete my understanding of the individual, of the individual by studying uh, individual psychology. Um, uh, I graduated the Adlerian psychotherapy program in, uh, here in Israel and since then I've got the uh, private clinic and, uh, and I serve, uh, I'm privileged, as Shirley said before, I'm privileged to serve as, as uh, Rachel's uh, teacher assistant um, and that's all for the meantime. Our program today will be uh, answering several questions that uh, Shira, Adi, and Shirley uh, are asking me. And I hope that through these questions, I will be able to elaborate more about the powerful, uh, the powerful work with early recollections. And then we'll have a very short demonstration of a case study that uh, Shira Harpas uh, brought with her. It's part of the ritual for work in supervision. And uh, we'll, I'll try to demonstrate how we incorporate the use of early recollections in the work of supervision. So uh, whoever wants to ask, please feel free and you can ask whatever you is interested. Uh, Rachel, in many of your papers you wrote, and I, uh, I want to quote you, um, you wrote, 
The use of early recollections is one of the most significant contributions of Alfred Adler to the field of psychology and a gift to Adlerian psychotherapy and supervision. Uh, could you please explain that? I found early recollections as a wonderful metaphoric way to discover the individual's way of thinking, the individual's perception of what life is and how does he uh, incorporate himself in whatever he perceives as life. And life includes family, work, friends, parenthood, relationship among siblings. Uh, we can find in each uh, ER a complete metaphor that will describe the way the person perceives others, perceives themselves, and that is how they behave. However, we also know that in every early recollection, we can discover the continuous creative abilities that every individual owns. As Adler said, that every individual is born with tremendous creative powers. These creative powers are shown in each ER, and that is why I encourage very much psychotherapists and supervision to pursue <laughs> as, as, as much as possible their ability to work with ERs because it, it includes so much information about the individual's ability to cope with life. Very often when an individual comes to therapy, they are completely unaware of their strength and ability to cope with whatever happened to them. They come with a, a feeling of a weakness, of a helplessness, of a, a, a kind of thinking that they are doomed a, and others are successful. And it is so important at that very specific moment of helplessness to show them their ability and their strength and their creative power. And we can find it in each and every ER. And that is mainly what we are doing when we work with early recollections. Um, you uh, say that Adler's approach is an optimistic approach. Mm -hmm. Can you please explain more about it? What do you mean? Yes. Uh, <coughs> When uh, we deal in psychotherapy with the person's disease or the person's weaknesses, actually we are uh, delivering a very negative message to the patient. When we are emphasizing the individual's strengths and abilities and we remind the individual of his past successful uh, events, we encourage them very much to uh, be able to use their resources in order to cope better with whatever they face today in the present. Because the message is that no matter what happens to you and no matter what kind of background is uh, shaping your way of looking at life, you can always use your resources in order to do things better than you did in the past or maybe change and do other things in order to prove to yourself that you can really do it. Every early recollection shows whatever individuals can do in order to change and shape a little different the way they behave and the way they move. And the reason I am, uh, one, one thing that really emphasizes the optimistic, Adler's optimistic view is the fact 
that the Adler's theory is a holistic theory that is based on a continuous movement. When we believe in movement, we become very optimistic. Pessimistic is to think that we are stuck, that we cannot move, we are paralyzed. But when we believe that life is a continuous ongoing movement, we are encouraged when we work with the clients or the patients, and we also are able to encourage the patients or the clients and to believe that things can really be different. Shirley, are you satisfied with the, the answer to your question? Yes, it sounds very, very optimistic. It, oh, I also feel optimistic right now. Can you, can you share a little bit about why do you feel optimistic? Because that, that, that really is the message for why do we work with individual psychology, at least in individual psychology, and especially with early recollections. Uh, first of all, I, I know it from, from a taking therapy, from Adlerian approach. So I remember how does it feel to come into a session and to come out optimistic and not to come out uh, feeling uh, more depressed that I need to, to overwork and something is wrong with me. And as a, as a therapist, just to come uh, to, to see the person who's coming with, with this approach of hope and movement, uh, it, it brings a lot of uh, uh, optimistic view of the world. Shirley, do you have an example of uh, your own earlier collection that really encouraged you when you used it in, in your own therapy? Or during your studies? Yes, I think I have one. I'm thinking when, uh, if for, for this demonstration, I'm thinking if, if to give a, a positive early memory or on the other hand, to give not such a positive story, just to see that from an unpositive story, you can bring the forces. And so the, you have an answer to your question yes, already. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, I remember that uh, I was, uh, I had a brother who was one year old and uh, my mother told me, she went to a friend and she told me, please uh, take your uh, brother uh, on a carriage and walk with him on the street while I'm talking to my friend. And carriages then were very big. It's not like today that they're very small. And the road was very narrow. And I was really trying to really, really uh, walk with, with him. And then he fell, the, the fell, and he fell from the carriage to the road. Well, one year. And I was really panicked and really scared and stuff like this. And I, How old were you? I was probably six. Mm -hmm. I was really young. And uh, I, I was really scared. I thought something happened. I ran to him. I saw that everything is okay. I put him in the carriage and I ran to my mother. And uh, she screamed at me, wow, what happened? Wow, how didn't, you were not responsible. How did you do that? Blah, 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 blah. And it was very traumatic. And I thought something would happen to him. So, and how do you, how do you, how do you feel when you tell this uh, story? Still, um, well, still when I am at that moment, uh, it's, it's very scary. Um, but now after I went through therapy and I look at this early memory in a different way. So how do different. you look at it now? What did encourage you when you first worked with this memory in a living psychotherapy using early recollections? It encouraged me that I know that I am a, a person of responsibility. People can count on me, that I can do things independently that I was uh, going and uh, taking care of him, that I knew how to look for help with my mother, I knew that I cannot do anything, that I, and even that I knew that I did something wrong um, and probably couldn't handle everything. Something I was helpless, I was just a child. And it's okay to, to make mistakes, it's okay that something happened. And still I went to her and I asked her for help. And uh, I didn't like that she was angry at me, but uh, sometimes you, you'll do things in life and people will be angry at you and it's still okay. Great. I, I think it was a wonderful example of how can a person with a 
such a discouraging metaphor comes to come to therapy because it probably reflected something that you experienced at that time. Every, every metaphor is usually a, a, a whole, full, very accurate description of what happens to the person in the present. So at that moment when you told this story, you probably felt very discouraged mm -hmm. because nobody can rely on you, terrible things happen when you take on responsibility, and here you did work with the memory and you felt exactly the opposite. That uh, people can rely on you, but you know your limits and you know what is it that you can be responsible for and what is it that you cannot. And that, and, of course. And that you can always ask for help. Yes, and it keeps me moving. That's great. Rachel, I want to ask about the movement you mentioned before. Yes, yes. How can we identify the movement in the, okay. in the therapy? It's a, it's a very important question because uh, we have ways to identify the movement in, uh, in, in the uh, early recollections. We have to remember the very basic uh, theoretical concept that Adler gave us and taught us and mentioned in, uh, in his writings. Every human being, every individual craves and strives to move towards the feeling of belonging, of contributing, of feeling significant in each cycle of his life, in families, in a world of work, with friends, and the sensation of feeling belonging makes the person feel a whole person because he feels that he contributes and he feels that he is also getting support and understanding and encouragement from the people that he belongs to. So it's a, it's a cyclic uh, dynamic between the individual and the whole uh, and every cycle of his life and and the world people who contribute to the world people who develop social interest are very happy human beings people who are indulged only in themselves and do not think about others but only about oneself is most of them develop uh, uh, all kinds of mental diseases like uh, like uh, addictions, uh, neuroticism, neurotism, uh, um, depression, anxieties. The movement we discover in each ER through identifying the person's strategies in order to feel belong. In some of the writings, in some of the Adlerian writings, the term is mentioned by the term uh, goals, that every human being has goals in order to uh, secure and assure feelings of belonging. I try to define between the main goal, which is to belong, and the ways, the, the means to reach this goal, which I refer to as strategies. And when I teach how to use early recollections, I also teach how to identify the strategies in order to feel and secure belonging. Sometimes very effective strategies in a certain point in life are completely ineffective in other stages of life. If a child feels that the way uh, he, f he, he secures his belonging is by sticking out, he's always the first, he knows the answers in the class, he is the person who makes fun and everybody claps hands, and if, it, if the person develops it as the only main strategy to reach the sense of belonging, if that is the only strategy that paves the movement, 
Very often, uh, th this person will feel discluded and he will come to therapy to find out how is it that the movement worked so well for so many years and all of a sudden he does exactly the same thing and it doesn't work at work and it doesn't work in his couple relationship and it for sure doesn't work in his relationship with his children because the children want to be the center and they don't like their father to be always the center. So we can identify this movement or these strategies uh, whether the strategies are stuck or they changed, we can find it in ERs. So this is why when we work with ERs, we want to try and find if there is movement. And movement is change. If the person is stuck with the same strategies, it means that there is no movement. If the person develops new strategies, it means that there is movement. So I, I don't know if I did. So we can see the movement by, by having a different strategies? By having new strategies, yes. by finding new strategies. Sometimes we do find in the memory other strategies that the patient is not aware of. And we try to show the person and say, look, there are a few more strategies that you don't really use right now. And maybe they are more effective right now than the ones that you are so used to, that gradually become destructive. Some people become addicted to the old strategies. So we can find addiction, addiction to, new, to old strategies. It always worked. It is going to work again. And I don't want to give up something that really works for me. And, and that is one thing that we are working with in a, in the ERs, uh, uh, yes. Thank you. Shirley, Shira, any more questions? Um, I wanted to ask you, you told, uh, you answered Adi about um, new um, strategies. New, new strategies. And I wanted to ask the, the patient or the, the individual, he doesn't actually have to let go his old strategies. You're talking about uh, two, actually two paths in therapy. One would be uh, learning to use new strategies and the other would be with the old strategies only in, in the right place, the right times and the right um, dose. That's so. It's ac actually two exactly. two goals in the same. Yeah, actually, it's not two goals. It's the same goal. Okay. Uh, basically, when we talk about strategies, we talk about the person's strength. Mm -hmm. And every human being likes very much to use his strength in order to feel good about himself. This is how he feels that he contributes to the, to the group. This is how he feels that he belongs. Sometimes, when a person starts to feel excluded, is when he overdoses on the use of his good qualities, of his strong uh, uh, ways to bring himself and, and, and secure his feelings of belonging. So what we are trying to do when we, when we find it in ERs is first of all to help the person to modify, to modify his strengths and to show them that when they use it in, a, in an overdose se uh, fashion, it works against them. Not to give it up completely, to lean on it, but to lean on it in a, in a way that is uh, suitable. To, to the situation, to the people around, to how he feels or she feels at, at that specific moment, to be able to read the reality and to match the strength I own to the reality I have to cope with right now. So that is how we uh, try to work with patients 
using ERs because in a metaphoric way, it is so much easier to show when it is overdosed, when it is the right dosage, and when is, uh, when is needed to find uh, new strategies. And most of the times, we find the new strategies in other memories. So we have the resources in the memories the person brings to the session. So as a, I'll put in one term from uh, the physiotherapy, you're actually talking about flexibility. Flexibility, exactly. Exactly. And it goes with movement. Yes. Like the corona. Corona. <laughs> Cor <laughs> coronavirus attacked us without any preparation. It came as a very unwanted, uh, unprepared uh, situation to the entire world. Some people felt during the corona, um, corona closure, a tremendous uh, ideas came up, tremendous creative abilities were uh, discovered. Uh, people decided that it is a wonderful time to invest in couple relationship, in, in the children. They felt that they stopped the race and they can really uh, think more about their life and if they really would like to continue life the way they led their life earlier. They thought about their strategies and how they use the strategies to feel that they belong and they contribute and all of a sudden something happened and they have to realize that they have to use the strategies in a different way. They have to cope with a new situation those who are flexible very quickly found ways to deal very well with it. And even some of my patients called me and said, they don't you need know, therapy. I don't need therapy. I feel so good now because things happen exactly the way I would like them to happen. And other people who are less flexible and are very stuck with the way they deal with life felt that it is a terrible crisis. They were the people that the optimistic ones needed to go and to help them to cope better with the unexpected crisis. To find, we actually to like, find the way yes, to adjust. Yes. yes. We would like, and, and that's one of the basic goals in Aglion psychotherapy, is to help the person once he is done with therapy to believe that no matter what happens, he has the resources to be able to use different methods, different strategies in order to cope with new challenges. unexpected challenges and situations. And that is only when one is aware of their strengths. When they are not aware of their strengths, they feel stuck in the old way because that's the only way that works. Mm -hmm. No other way works. Okay, thank you, Shira. Thank you for the question. Yes, any more questions? Uh, Rachel, in some of the writings I uh, came across on the concepts of basic mistakes. Um, so how do you uh, relate to this concept uh, in connection with early recollections? Okay. Uh, I believe uh, very much in uh, Adler's optimistic way of dealing with patients. And I think that when a patient comes to therapy and they are so discouraged and so helpless to show them the mistakes they had done, that, uh, that uh, they, the results are now, uh, they're suffering, I don't think that that is the, a proper way to build the person's uh, belief in themselves. So I look at what the concept basic mistakes says as overdosed strategies or strategies that are ineffective for the present situation. It could be that there are still 
very effective in certain situations or were very effective in the past, but they are a little ineffective or ineffective in the present situation and this is where we encourage very much flexibility. We don't erase it. By saying basic mistakes, we kind of put an X on the person's beliefs, ways of dealing with life. And I think that we, uh, we adopted Adler's theory as a theory of a high respect to the human being and belief to the strength human beings own. And therefore, I feel that the use of the concept basic mistakes is not right if we want to be consistent with the, with the respect and the belief in the strengths and creative abilities of human beings. So it is very much uh, uh, an issue in the way that I teach how to use early recollections and I really refuse to use the concept or the term basic mistakes. I'd rather use effective or ineffective strategies, which gives a lot of respect to the person's choices, but also teaches the person to be flexible with their choices. Mm -hmm. And to be more aware of their environment and to, and to the other aware. people, yes. Yes. in order to understand what, yes. how to behave. Yes, yes. To translate, to translate better the reality. And, and, and then to be able to match their behavior and their, uh, and their uh, uh, perception of the new reality. Some people are refuse sometimes <laughs> to change their perception of the reality, but the reality changes. And that's part of the movement. Everything is in, in a constant moving. Okay. okay. Adit, you want to ask something? How does change occur in the therapeutic relations? Mm -hmm. uh, change, actually change is the main goal in psychotherapy. Because if we, if we rely on the concept of a holistic movement in the, in the development of every human being, that will probably be, and it is, the development of a therapeutic relationship. The idea is that the person who completes a, a, his therapy will feel that he is not afraid of change and also will feel that he is, uh, he is actualizing few things in his life that he can put a label on them that he changed them. Uh, early recollections are a wonderful, wonderful way to help people to change their perceptions, their ideas about how to deal with life, their strategies, uh, and how to use new strategies, how to modify old strategies. Uh, Adler uses the expression of reconstruction ERs. And when a person tells a story, like the story that Shirley shared with us earlier. And uh, the therapist uh, suggests the client to tell the story in a way that, uh, for example, in Shirley's case, that Shirley will not feel so helpless and so shocked and so, uh, and so uh, uh, weak with the fact that her brother fell off the cart. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, Shirley has some new ideas after she worked with this ER. Can you remember uh, what kind of new feelings or new uh, attitudes you adapt to your previous ER? If I could tell uh uh, from my age to Shirley, who was six years old then, I would tell her, tell her or suggest to her a few things. One is when she's given a responsibility, she should not be so eager to satisfy 
her mother or to do things so right because I think at that moment I wanted to set to be such a responsible girl and to do something so I wasn't so much paying attention to the details of the road I remember and if I would relax a little bit I would tell I would tell her surely relax a little bit it's okay they give you but now it's you can relax it's okay you can trust yourself more and then I would look more at the details and I think it wouldn't have happened I was so tense to make things right. Okay, so usually when Shirley shares with me a, such a new idea about the memory, I will ask Shirla, Shir, uh, Shirley and I'll ask you now, and how is it in reality right now in your life? Do you sometimes neglect looking at details and then you feel that something unexpected happens? Do you see that in, uh, as a result of your therapy, you pay more attention to details and by that you prevent from such things to happen? Mm -hmm. Very good questions. Okay, so what, what will be very good answers to the very good questions? I, I do it. I do it. I can tell you right now how, how uh, many examples, but I think maybe it will take our time. But Give I definitely... just one example. Um, just example is sometimes I want to, uh, sometimes I need more time. Sometimes I need more time to, to, to uh, give results or to do something. And I sometimes from such pressure, I don't pay attention to the details. I want to satisfy other people that I do it in time. And sometimes now, right now I'm saying, excuse me, I, I need more time. Is it possible to have it? And then I'm relaxed and I can really, because I like to be involved in what I'm doing. I think I could be more enjo enjoying the trip with my brother on the road, to be more involved with it and enjoy it. And what Shirley said just now is uh, written in a quite long article that Iris Lavon, uh, Dr. Iris Lavon and myself wrote about the uh, powerful use of ERs in the process of reconstruction to change some connections in the brain. And we used a research that was done by uh, brain researchers and we show that uh, the newest brain research shows that when a person can tell previous stories in a different way, the perception about what happened in the past changes, and therefore their perception about what's happening in the present changes as well. And, and, and we find the, I, the process of reconstruction of ERs as a very powerful tool to, uh, to, uh, to be present to the process of change in psychotherapy. It happens in therapy. And that is why the use of ERs is quick, accurate, and it has results. And it has, a, relative to other sorts of psychotherapies, it has very quick results. We have to learn how to work with it because it's a very delicate, very delicate way of dealing with ERs and we have to study it and practice it and get a lot of supervision and that is why we have this supervision group here because we try, we try to be as, as precise as we can with analyzing the ERs and that is done in supervision. I have to emphasize the fact that uh, in addition to all the very wonderful things we mentioned so far about the use of ERs, I would like to add one more thing, that uh, in order to, to actualize what Adler said, to hear with the patient's ears, to see with the person's eye, and to feel with the person's heart, when we use ERs, we use the person's language and it helps us very much to quickly hear with his ears, see with his eyes, 
and feel with his heart. And that is what we do in psychotherapy and that is what we do in supervision. In supervision, in addition to do work with the patient's ERs and helping the therapist to see the, the, his patient through the ERs that he brings, we also use the therapist ERs in order to show the therapist his way of looking at his patient and sometimes his perceptions about the patient and very often when therapy gets stuck it is when the two lifestyles the therapist lifestyle and the patient's lifestyle collide in some way and that is exactly what I'm going to demonstrate very soon. We are moving now to the second part of our uh, video, which is a very short demonstration of a supervision session. Usually our sessions uh, last at least two hours with each case, but because we're limited with uh, the video time, we'll just show a glimpse of what we are doing in a supervision session. And Shira brought today a case study. So Shira, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, okay, so... Um, this uh, person is David, he's 28 years old. Uh, he's the youngest of four brothers, um, which are, one brother is plus nine, older than him. The other one is 12 years older and the, the first one is 13 and a half years older. So he actually grew up with... Like a single uh, child. Like a single child with five grown-ups, five adults around him. Uh, I think it's an important uh, fact. Factor. factor, yes. Um, David has, he's, as I said, he's 28. He has a BA in economics and law, uh, which he achieved uh, at the age of 25. Uh, he worked a very short while as a lawyer, just a few months. He hated it. He worked in the field of economics a few months. He hated it. And now he works in a, um, nothing special. He, he earns enough money, but he doesn't, and, and of course, he doesn't like what he does. Um, he has a girlfriend for the last two years. He says he has a few friends. Uh, he doesn't talk about his social life. Um, and he applied for therapy. Uh, feeling stuck and frust frustrated with his present job. He's afraid of leaving it because, as he said, I left one job, I left the other, another job, and if I leave this one, what does it say, what does it mean uh, to me and about. about me, and what will my parents say, my brothers, and everyone. So he hasn't yet left it, but he hates it. He's frust frustrated. He's, he hates it. Um, he speaks. So let's, let's move to the early recollections and then okay. we'll find out what. So the first early recollection, he was four years old. Uh, I was walking with my parents on each side, holding my hands and occasionally, occasionally swinging me in the air. My brothers are running together ahead of us. The focus is my little hands held by my parents. The feeling is safe and fun when they swing me forward. Second early recollection, age seven. I went to the mall with one of my parents. I think it was my birthday. We stopped by a pet shop and I, and I asked if we could go in. After a while, we came out with a new little hamster. It was bought for me. I don't remember asking for it, but it made me very happy. The focus, there are two, 
two of them. The first one is uh, we're standing outside looking at the animals through the window. And the second one, uh, I'm holding the little hamster. Okay. Uh, the feeling is I'm happy, but puzzled. I don't know how to treat this new little creature. Third early recollection, the age is six. The whole family went to the mall, again the same, the same mall. Suddenly I found my, myself alone with all these grown-ups around. I couldn't see anything but feet and shoes. I began crying loudly. It seems as if it took ages until my parents found me. The focus, all these grown-ups around and I cannot find my parents, the feeling lost and scared. And the fourth recollection, uh, the lesson ended and I went out for, for the lunch break with some, of, uh, some other children. One of my classmates fell on the stairs and his chin was cut and bleeding. He was crying. Focus, the blood on, on his face and clothes. The feeling, I don't remember, but I guess I was frightened. I think I just stood there looking at him. I was young and I didn't know what to do, but I didn't run away. Okay. <clears throat> so in order to, to uh, facilitate what Shira already knows about her client, uh, if we look at the four ERs, uh, Adi, Shirley, and Shira, of course, uh, what can you say is the common denominator among all the four uh, ERs? And, and it probably will present his way of looking at life. What can we say about the way he looks at life? Uh, I, I think it's quite um, clear to you. Uh, clear to me. Okay. He's, so can you say something about it? Always the small one, the young one, the one who doesn't know how, who doesn't know what, uh, who doesn't know how to react, with, what to do, in, in different situations. Uh, he relies on adults. Uh, to, to swing him forward, to do the movement for him. Um, he relies on adults to know what the answers are, to, to maybe to teach him. I'm not sure it's in the um, memories, but, but he does rely on others, to t uh, grown-ups, to teach him. Um, and, but it goes with expectations uh, and that he can't stand. I mean, he's very clever, very intelligent, and he's expected to know and understand, but he doesn't. And that's the, the clench, that's what... And life is dangerous. And life is dangerous. And you can fall on your chin and, uh, and have blood all over, and it's very scary. <clears throat> and um, we, we, what you brought us today is a 28 years old young man that is the youngest in the family. And uh, we know that in general, uh, young men at the age of 28 only, only complete the teenage uh, period of their life and start to feel adults. <laughs> And it looks as if he comes to you in order to learn how to be an adult. How to be able to walk uh, without holding the parents' hands. How to be able to buy himself whatever he needs to buy, and that is choosing a proper career for himself. And uh, how to feel that uh, growing up doesn't really necessarily mean not to get lost. And uh, what he is telling you uh, gives you a lot of information about his abilities. What do you know about his abilities? Because the idea is, I want to grow up. I don't really know how to do it right now. When I grew with my parents, they did everything for me. Now I need to learn it by, on my own and I'm scared. I'm very afraid. Mm -hmm. Life is so dangerous and I'm really scared. I have a little hamster now. I don't really know what to do with it. And that's probably his new relationship with his partner. You know, which he's not sure about. Which he's he, like. He doesn't really know what to do with it. It's like having a hamster and not really know how to, how to raise it because he's so, so uh, indulged in himself. 
he doesn't really look at the other person. He's also the hamster himself. He's the hamster this himself. This little thing that yes. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. That how is to how myself. That is how you feel. Yeah, that's my, <laughs> my subjective. <laughs> you, the, yeah, that's the therapist, that's probably true. feels as if he is this little hamster that came to your office and you don't really know what to do with him. I feel that uh, from the early memories, even when good things are happening to him, like with the hamster, or bad things are happening to him when he fell, he doesn't know why it happened. He has no idea what happened to him and how did it come through. Who bought it? Suddenly he has the hamster. Who did it? How? So even now when he has a, maybe a good job, or I don't know if it's a good job or a bad job, or if he has a relationship, how, how did it happen? What was his part? So there is an issue with taking responsibility. Yes. For good or bad. Yes. So, and, and we know that this is one thing we would like to deal yeah. with. In and therapy. choices. Responsibility Making and choices, choices, taking responsibility, and being able to say, it is my choice. Mm -hmm. I choose to have a girlfriend. I choose to work here. I choose to work here because I need right now the money, in spite of the fact that this is not the best possible job for me. But I'm only 28 and I still have a few more years to go in order to find my way uh, around the, mm -hmm. my career. And, and, and pay the price. And uh, pay the price, yeah. okay. But growing up means to learn how to pay the price. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're so short in time, you know, we could go on and, 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 and elaborate more about the your patient's ERs because we can see that there are some strategies and there is a contract between himself and you and what is expectations of you. But we want to, uh, to really be able to, um, to emphasize the ability of the use of ERs to show where is it that you as a therapist is stuck with the patient. Okay, so I feel that we are both stuck. He's stuck in being the young one, the small one that doesn't know and doesn't, he doesn't really want to know. Uh, it's very convenient to re rely on others. Um, and I'm stuck in, in being an, the, the adult he relies on. And I feel it was okay at the beginning, at the few, very few uh, first sessions, he needed me as the adult, someone to give him a hand and okay, let's go together. But now I feel I'm stuck there. I mean, I feel even though I let go, I don't hold him, I'm just like this. He's holding on very tight onto me and I can't let go this role of being the, the responsible adult, the one that decides for him or that says things I don't want to say. I want him to... to okay. Know. It is very important to, uh, to find the, uh, the, the accurate point where therapy uh, is, is changing, when the therapeutic relationship is changing because Therapy, as everything else in, the, in life, is a process. It is always an ongoing, continuous movement. And uh, very often when a person comes to therapy, he needs a lot of holding and containing and empathy. But there is a stage in therapy where the person needs to feel and believe that they are independent and they can stand very uh, secure on, on their both two legs. And <clears throat> the idea is to develop a differentiation from being dependent or overly dependent on the therapist. And that sometimes uh, is shown in the ERs as here. And when we do, when we work on reconstruction of let's say the first ER, where he walks in the shopping center, or wh wh where was it? They, they go out and they, they hold hands and he swings. And if you can do some reconstruction with him, with this ER, how can he swing, enjoy, have fun without holding hands? Is it possible? Can he suggest the four-year-old to come up with some new ideas about 
having fun without holding the parents' hands? Or uh, can he uh, decide... I think, okay, if I can say something, I think he knows it's possible, it's only here. Because okay. he does see his older brothers running forward and without okay, the so parents. So he knows it's a possibility. Okay, working with ERs in the process of reconstruction is <coughs> transforming the knowledge that it's possible to the, act, to the action, to do it. To, to really act on it. Mm -hmm. So when he gives you an idea about what the four-year-old can do, and you immediately translate it to his reality, he knows what can be done in reality. He will come up with new ideas. I have a question about this guy. Okay. We can see he's now learning how to be an adult. And to be an adult needs to be very responsible for your life, but not everything works as you plan. And you can fall down and bleed, and it hurts. But you don't run away. Mm -hmm. You stand. Which is his strength. Yes, that's what, what, what I can see. Um, when I'm looking now at, the, at, at his part of life, when Shira stopped to hold his hand and just mm -hmm. standing there for him, we can show him that he has the strength, strength to, to stand and if, run away. even if he bleeds because it's part of life mm -hmm. and not run, away. not run away. But what he's describing here in his ERs, uh, I didn't run away, I, I, I stood there, is kind of, you know, it, it reflects his, uh, his feeling of getting, uh, becoming paralyzed. It is so scary that I couldn't even move. Because he really used to have grown up around that's right. to solve his problems. Okay. But and now he is, can do it in and, and, himself. And, and that's exactly what we try to do in therapy. We try to help him to be able to cope with life even if you fell down if you if you if you fell down and, and, and bleed. And, and not to not to not to not to be not to, to get panicked and not to be paralyzed because you're so afraid of what happens to you. But the issue now is not uh, so much uh, David, but she says that she's stuck because she feels as if she received a hamster, 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 she holds it in her hands and she doesn't really know exactly what to do with it. So can you please, Shira, share a memory with us? Because as long as you treat him as a hamster, and that you don't really know what to do with him, then dependence will be the name of your game with him. And you don't want him to be dependent on you. But is there a memory that popped out right now? I think that it will be a good one. Yes. It's funny because while talking, I, I listen to you and I have this memory like, hey, I'm here. Um, I was, I think, something like eight, maybe nine. Okay. Uh, at school. And usually, you know, we write down the memory, okay? Okay, so I'll say it slowly. Um, I was eight, maybe nine years old. Um, we just ended, it was in class, we just ended uh, an exam. Uh, and the teacher called up a few of us to come up to her. She handed out, she gave us, um, each of us, uh, papers. And she told us that she's going to divide the whole class into pairs. And we should give each pair one page. Um, and then in pair, when we were in pairs, uh, she told us that we should uh, choose two missions uh, from the list on the page. And these missions, uh, all together, the whole, all the missions of the class will be part of the preparations for a party. I think it was the end of the year party or something like that. 
So when we were in pairs, uh, we went over the whole list. Uh, I don't remember what we chose, but we did. Um, we chose and we started working on it. We started preparing. Shira, what is the, the picture that you can remember the most, the best? I think there are two of them. The first one is uh, a few of us, I think we were three or four of us standing around the teacher and she's explaining to us what the schedule is. Um, I felt some, I think, like, ah, she called me up. Proud? Maybe proud and, and even um, uh, privileged. And the second one is when we actually worked in pairs. Um, I remember us going through the list and, and choosing the moment we chose. We said, okay, this is what we want to do. This is what we take responsibility for. Uh, and the feeling was... Um, some kind of excitement, mm -hmm. excitement, even fun. Yeah, it's funny because I say that and I feel my pulse going quicker. So what you're saying, you're saying, <clears throat> when I'm chosen to fulfill a task, it fills me with pride and happiness and I feel privileged. And when I work in a pair and we fulfill the task, I feel very excited and I feel very much uh, how the energy flows in my body. That's true. And I, I think that as, his, as David's therapist, you know how one can feel when one can fulfill tasks. And I think that your frustration with him is that he is still not at this stage. He I is. I need you to explain that to some more. From knowing yourself, you know how one feels when one fulfills a task, when one is chosen to fulfill a task, and one has the opportunity to choose which task he wants to fulfill. Mm -hmm. So both when you're chosen and when you can choose and when you can work with a partner, this is what makes you feel grown up. Yes, it does. This is what makes you feel so full of energy. And you're very desperate because you do want to see David at this stage, choosing a task, enjoying the task he's choosing, enjoying what he does. <coughs> and it frustrates you that he, not like Shira, doesn't like what he does, really spoiled, hates everything that is uh, provided to him, is not happy with the list of tasks he has from which he can choose whatever he likes to choose. And you are very impatient with the process because David is only 28, the youngest in his family. And there is a process that he has to go through in therapy and the process is in each one of the memories. Memory number one, to learn how to run, enjoy life, do things independently. Memory number two is how to be able to hold on to something that life gave him, knowing what to do with it. Memory number three is uh, how to feel 
in a strange place with nobody around that you can still manage, ask for help, and find your way. And memory number four is even when something happens to you, you can still cope, you can get up and continue to run and enjoy and have fun with life. Before he goes through this process of reconstruction, the way he looks at himself, the way he looks at life, the way he perceives life and dangers of life, he cannot be so excited with the tasks that the world prepared for him. Mm -hmm. To be part of a family, to be part of being in the world of work, or to be part of a, a couple relationship or friends. So that is quite a goal for you to work with him and not feeling frustrated that he is not there yet. He has a way to go. Thank you, Sira, very much. Thank you. For thank your you. memory. I think I've got a lot of... And for uh, David's memories. And thank you, Adi. And thank you, Shirley. Thank you. And thank you, Peter and Dennis, for all the work that you invested in preparing our video, because a lot of people in Ikasi around the world will probably appreciate your work, Peter and Dennis. Thank you.